Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar between Credible and Armanino. I'm going to dive right in and give some intros for our esteemed presenters today. So first, we have Mike Gorl, who's the partner in charge of national cannabis and hemp practice at Armanino, which is a large accounting firm in many states throughout the U.S., um, and he has an interesting story. So in 2015, Mike, you were living in Texas, working in public accounting, and you just woke up one day and realized that the legalization of cannabis was happening and that nobody had written the book on it. And so you said, I'm going to move to California. I'm going to learn about it and I'm going to write the book. <laughs> so, yeah, I, um, I, I was commuting back and forth between California and, and Dallas during that period. So, yeah. Amazing. Amazing. So then you, you partnered with Thomas Reuters. You wrote the complete treatise on multi-state cannabis taxation, and um, which is obviously a very complex area of law. And you now lead Armanino's cannabis tax group. So it sounds like you travel a lot. You're obviously a very sought after expert in this space. And we're just delighted to have you here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And then Brian Fitzpatrick, who is my hero, the chairman and CEO of Credible. Um, Brian has been an executive leader and a fantastic innovator in the technology space for over 25 years. He is one of the OGs of blockchain-based technology. He worked in the um, mortgage industry for many, many years and has always been a creative problem solver. So when the idea around cannabis and CBD supply chains came, you know, kind of across his radar at this season of his career. He decided to activate um, an elite team of developers and has created the world's first and best monitoring platform for the cannabis, CBD and hemp supply chain. So obviously, Brian, I'm always thrilled to speak with you. Wow. Thanks, Joy. Does the OG stand for old goat? Is that... <laughs> I think it's like an original goat. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Just, just making sure. That's it. I don't think that's right. <laughs> well, we're excited to kick off today and hear from um, both of these great men about um, cannabis accounting. So, you know, Brian, if you kind of want to kick us off with our first topic, I know we've got great dialogue and we want to pack it all in. Absolutely. So, Mike, great to have you here. I've uh, been following your work for a long time and um uh, you know, we're pleased that you're uh, now on our marketplace, that Armanino's in our marketplace, which means that uh, Credible is vetted and verified the firm as uh, one of the top leading experts in the industry. So, uh, you know, you could you can check out our marketplace on Credible and uh, see more information about Armanino. So we're, we're pleased and very thrilled to be talking to the guy who wrote the book. And uh, we're going to sort of kick off talking about the regulatory considerations, uh, you know, in accounting, because you can't think about, you know, accounting without thinking about this ever changing and complex uh, state and federal laws. Uh, and, you know, significant attention, you know, needs to be paid in, to understanding these laws and getting the controls and the fundamental accounting uh, right. So, um, the traditional rules of even the traditional rules of safeguarding acts, uh, assets, you know, that we see in other industries certainly applies very much so to this industry, which again, leads back to internal, uh, internal controls. And, um, especially since it's a mostly cash industry. So what are your thoughts about, uh, you know, best practices in this area and the things that folks really ought to be focusing on and buttoning up in this ever changing dynamic world of cannabis? Well, you know, traditionally, you know, people that enter into the cannabis business, you know, either are people that know how to grow the cannabis plant, maybe they're great at marketing uh, their brand and their products, but they don't really pay enough attention to the back office, the accounting, the boring stuff, the taxes and things like that, because none of that really enhances their, you know, sales of their product and, and, in their mind, the valuation of the product or the valuation of the company. But unfortunately, what you really have to do is pay much more attention to this back office uh, information because, you know, in the old days, and I'm talking about, you know, four or five years ago, you know, all you had to do was have a, a cannabis license and a brand and you could sell it, you know, for a, a huge premium and nobody cared. Uh, sort of like, you know, for Brian and I, old timers, you know, we remember the dot com days when all you had to have was a website and all of a sudden your company was worth a hundred million dollars. Well, a fax those days are gone. Needed, a fax machine. needed a fax yeah. machine too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, you know, but those days are gone now and, and there's a lot of competition out there. There's a lot of companies out there. And so 
even if you have a successful cannabis company, you're not going to get the valuation that you're seeking because most of my clients are looking to get out of the business within three to five years. No one's yeah. looking to have like this legacy company. They're going to be like Hershey's chocolate or something and pass it down to their kids or something, you know, right. they want to get in, they want to get out, which that's fine. But if that's your business model, then you got to really pay attention to your books and records and make sure that, Hey, if you say you did a hundred thousand in sales this month, great. Let's prove it. Let's, let's demonstrate how, you know, that a hundred thousand came to be uh, because if, if you can't really verify it, then, you know, it's, it's just, a it might as well be a projection because, you know, it's, it's nothing more than that. Well, I've, I've sold uh, a few companies in my time and I've bought uh, a few companies in my time. And, uh, and given the fact that it's sort of the dreams, goals, and desires of a lot of these companies to, you know, sell in three to five years, maybe go public, raise capital, either in the form of debt or equity, uh, you know, the things you're talking about are extremely important because I've been through those, you know, uh, colonoscopy routines, if you will, <laughs> when you're in the process of selling your company. And, you know, they're diving into everything on a due diligence basis. So given that sort of backdrop and, you know, sort of this this regulatory environment, I mean, I think it's absolutely critical that these controls um, are in place. I mean, you bring up an excellent point there. Uh, any other advice for uh, for these companies uh, relative to uh, to these controls and things they ought to be doing? Yeah, well, timing is really critical, too, because if your exit is, is three to five years, you don't wait until two years from now to begin this process, because unfortunately, what happens is, you know, a client will come up and, and say, hey, I just got this letter of intent. You know, someone really wants to buy my company and I'm thinking I want to really do this deal. Great. And, and, and they're talking about, hey, I got to have this data room filled with all these documents and support to, to you know, have them review it. And they need it by Friday. I'm like, that's just <laughs> not going to happen. <laughs> you, you, this is. You know, like if you were to come to me with any cannabis company that's been in operation for a couple of years, you know, and say, hey, Mike, you know, I need you to do some sort of, you know, financial review or, or, or even an audit to, to like verify, you know, the numbers that they have in, in their financial statements. Um, we would have to go back two years and roll back all of those numbers. And, and the, the real difficult ones are going to be cash and beginning and ending inventory. Those are two difficult things to like determine after the fact. And so it, it's a timely and costly endeavor. Um, but if you don't go through that process, then this LOI is, is just gonna go, go away because that investor or the company that wants to buy you is just gonna go down you know, to a different you know, company that does have their act together, has their books and records pulled. Yeah, because I mean, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how good your cannabis is. Uh, it, it really, investors are looking at these risk factors, which is uh, absolutely critical. And, and it seems to be that cannabis businesses are also at a higher risk of audit, which sort of brings in another boogeyman that they've got to sort of deal with. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, the IRS has really been um, using Colorado for several years to, as a, like a test bed to like audit uh, and train other auditors on cannabis companies because we we asked you know with the freedom of information ask, act um the irs for some internal documents about their audits of cannabis companies and and in that document it revealed you know some very interesting information um it basically said that hey you know if you audit a um a cannabis company, you will generate two to three times, maybe even four times, I don't remember the exact numbers, uh, of revenue per hour of time spent by an auditor than if they spent that same amount of time on a non-cannabis company. And since 280E is really the only major issue for, you know, cannabis audits, you know, from the IRS's perspective, it's a fairly easy audit, you know, because you're looking at one issue everybody's going to have a different interpretation of, of what 280E includes or does not include. And therefore it creates this like gray area 
that's advantageous for taxpayers, but it's also advantageous to the IRS because everybody can, you know, interpret 280E differently. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I've noticed, I actually, I've, uh, I've seen recently a couple companies that uh, we've worked with that are sort of going backwards and they, they, they're going back into the year of 12 months, 24 months and having to refix things because of activities that they're doing now that are absolutely critical. And, and that's, I mean, that's really, really hard to do. So, you know, making sure to me as, as a CEO for now many, many years of different companies, I can tell you that I've, it's always been important to me to have a good lawyer and a good accountant, right? Because those are two areas of what I call prevention. It's almost like an insurance policy. If you're getting everything right and you're dotting your I's and crossing your T's, and even in these businesses, I, I see very little good governance going on. You know, so from a legal and accounting perspective, it, those two go hand in hand. I've seen companies try to raise capital and forgot to issue more shares. I mean, yeah. you know, that that's like a, a, a lawsuit or a problem waiting to happen in the end. And what happens is when they get to one of these events where they're going to be raising money or selling the company, uh, whatever it is, this stuff all gets found in due diligence. Investors are very, very good at digging in. <laughs> You know, well, and, and, and more so of the fact that it's a poor reflection of management because, you know, they're going to see that, hey, if you're not dealing with your taxes, your books and records, you know, and, and taking it seriously and being very diligent about it, then they're going to think, well, what other things is management kind of trying to slip through here? And, and that's why, you know, you really just got to run these businesses like a professional business. And, and I highly recommend you know, people that are getting into this business that at some point this is going to get bigger than what you can handle. And I make the analogy of, of Steve Jobs of how he built a billion dollar company called Apple. And, you know, once it got to a billion dollars, the, the board fired him, you know, because he knew how to develop products, but he didn't know how to run a billion dollar enterprise. Yeah. And these cannabis companies can grow very rapidly much more rapidly than say a traditional business can. And we've seen clients that go from a million in sales in January to 10 million in sales by the end of the year. So, you know, with that kind of growth, you've really got to stay on top of, you know, cash flow, you know, cash management, you know, everything, you know, so that you don't grow too fast, too quickly. And, and these are the basics, but you know, what I hear is establish and maintain internal controls right up front. I mean, get them right, right from the beginning, because it's going to cost you way more, you know, in the end, implement and consistently follow those internal controls and include um, regular tasks within those controls and in, in staying on top of it, or closing your books in a timely manner, generating regular financial reports, you know, which frankly, a lot of this stuff can also be automated. Nobody really looks at the automation around these things. And we're going to talk a little bit about that later on. But those are, are critical things. So um, regulatory compliance on top of that is also important. So regular review and update these functions to make sure that you're not falling out of compliance. And I think that's one of the expertise, critical expertise of Armanino is uh and I've noticed you guys are not just working with the biggest of companies, but you're working with smaller to medium sized businesses as well. So it's not like your services are out of the reach. And quite frankly, you know, I think, as I've always said, great attorney, great, great uh, accountant, you know, firm behind you. It's going to save a lot of issues. I'm going to just shift a little bit. Um, I've noticed because of the tax challenges and that a lot of companies that typically would be an LLC are you know they're opting for you know more of a c corp even smaller businesses uh, can you talk a little bit about that and why that is yeah i mean you know many times people set up companies as llc's mainly because it's gonna probably have losses the first few years before it turns around and becomes profitable and those losses then flow up to the partners of the partnership you know in an llc situation so that way the investors you know they've made the investment in the cannabis company they don't expect to to get that return on that investment for a while but at least during the time that it's operating as a loss then it's beneficial to have those losses 
offset their other income that they have from other sources. Now, a C Corp, the advantage there is one, you know, you don't have to make an automatic distribution. So if there's profits there in the company, it can stay in the company. And if the company decides to issue a dividend, it can issue a dividend and then there's income to the shareholders of the corporation. The other benefit of a corporation is currently the corporate tax rate is much less than the personal income tax. So that's another advantage. And the final advantage is that most companies in, in the cannabis world, when they're going to be acquired by an outside party, it's probably going to be an MSO, probably an MSO that's already in a C Corp situation. And typically what they'll do is they'll structure the deal with 90% in cash going to the, you know, the, the, the target company. And the other 90% is going to be in stock of the MSO. And so if that 90% is exchanged for the stock of the cannabis company, that's the target, that's a stock for stock swap, no tax on that. And so until the, you know, the owner of the cannabis company sells the stock of the MSO, that's when it'll trigger a tax and, a, you know, and any sort of gain. But, you know, they can, you know, manage that by waiting a year to sell the stock and then they get capital gains treatment and they can wait five years, 10 years and kind of dribble it out over a longer period of time. So they don't have this one big tax bill uh, as they sell their company. So the C-Corp structure sort of makes sense <clears throat> since a lot of them have these dreams, goals and desires to sell, you know, in three to five years. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it does. OK, that's so that that makes a lot of sense. Now, and then there's a small business exception too. I forgot to mention that. And, and for companies that are under 25 million in, in, in revenue, then they can sell their stock uh, and not have tax on the first 25 million. Ah, oh, nice. And we're going to talk. That only bit. applies for founder stock. And so if you set up an LLC and then you convert to a C corporation in year, say, two or three, then that period for that exemption begins once you convert to a C-Corp. It's those original shares of the C-Corp that qualify. And there's so it's, a five-year it holding have, period for that. There doesn't have to be a separate class of shares called founder shares. It's just- No, no, founder. it's just the original um, shares. Okay. Yeah, original Got common it. shares. And there's a five-year holding period. So again, you know, if your exit strategy is to come out in five years, then if you start off as a C-Corp from the get-go, you start the clock running on that five-year holding period. That that makes a lot of sense. And I think that's that's good for the audience to understand that because a lot of these folks are, you know, as you said, they're not in it to create this this long-term legacy. They want to grow it. They want to they want to get out of it eventually. So these are all important implications for that. Um, another important implication and thing that is a is huge for profit and growth in the industry in, in the future. And, you know, we've always talked about it. it's just this rescheduling. And uh, recently there was a, um, a letter. It was a five page letter that was sent to uh, POTUS from six governors. So it was uh, 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 Polis from Colorado, Pritzker from Illinois, uh, Edwards from Louisiana, Hochul from New York and uh, Murphy from my home state, uh, New Jersey, uh, and also uh, Maryland, uh, Westmore. Those governors, they want to see the rescheduling by the year's end. Um, and I think I think that seeing that under the Christmas tree this year is not really in the cards. But, uh, you know, not sure what's going to what's going to happen there. What's your thought about uh, this rescheduling issue? You know, I, I think there's certainly been a lot of discussion and a lot more movement, you know, towards rescheduling, you know, this year than it has been in the, in the past. But. Unfortunately, you know, I think there's just too many other world and other economic issues that are, you know, going to be pressing um, that's going to take the attention away from from cannabis to, you know, the war in Gaza, the war in, in your Ukraine. You know, um, we still have issues, you know, concerning interest rates and, and, and the 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 federal budget is still, I think, been extended to maybe January. And so that's another thing that, you know, Congress is going to have to deal with here again soon. So I just don't see it really happening until maybe the second quarter 
or even, you know, as late as the beginning of the third quarter before we get into the elections, because that could be a way for Biden to boost his numbers to, you know, going into the election. But unfortunately, you know, there was a lot of hope when Biden became president because he then controlled the presidency, the House, the Senate. And it was kind of like the perfect storm to be able to make this happen. Um, but Biden's just not a very big promoter for cannabis. He never has been. He's never really voted for cannabis, you know, in his past as well. So I, I just don't see it happening. I know the cannabis community is really excited about it and we really want this to happen. But realistically, I just don't see it happening until later on um, this year, if at all. So if I read between the lines there, it's a political issue. He's going to deliver on his promise because there's an election coming for the uh, for the Democrats. I mean, that's sort of how it is. And and we do know, I mean, whether you're Republican or whether you're Democrat or somewhere in between, which I think half the world is right now in America. But uh, when you look at this, it, it, it's really a very political issue. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's uh, and it really it's also the will of the people that this happens. So I think the politicians have to listen to that. Um, the other thing on is safe banking. So uh, that, that's going to have a huge implication on the industry as well. And, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, that seems to be dragging on as well. What's your thoughts about safe banking? Yeah, safe banking is is one of those areas that I think both the, the left and right can agree on. Even the IRS wants this to happen because, you know, there are still many of our clients that have to schedule um, a, a cash deposit of, you know, to pay their taxes. And it's, it's dangerous for the cannabis company. It's dangerous for the IRS because you can imagine, you know, someone with a backpack that has one hundred thousand dollars in hundred dollar bills that are looking to pay their, you know, their, their federal or state uh, taxes. And, um, you know, the IRS even, you know, at their local offices, they have probably one single camera there, a security camera that was installed in the 1980s that probably doesn't even work. And yet they got to like, manage, <laughs> yeah, manage all this cash. Um, you know, now fortunately, you know, things have changed over the years and now there's some, I want to say five, 600 banks that will bank uh, cannabis companies, but it comes at a high cost. You know, most of them charge high fees um, for this service. There's a lot of um, know your uh, customer type information that needs to be divulged. They need to be able to source the, the funds, you know, that it's where the, the cash is coming from. They want to make sure, of course, that none of the illegal market um, entities are using this cannabis company as a way of laundering, you know, their cash. And, and, and so it, it gets very complicated. And so I think that, you know, if they could get to safe banking where, you know, people can bank just like any other company, it would really help cannabis companies raise capital, would help them, you know, be able to take out loans. Um, but unfortunately, you know, you look at the 2018, um, no, 20, no, 2018, yeah, 2018 um, Farm Bill made hemp fully legal, interstate commerce, banking, everything is, is supposed to be available. And we've seen many hemp companies still have trouble. They can't go to a Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and open up a bank account. You know, it looks like weed, it smells like weed, therefore it must be weed, you know, and, and that's kind of the attitude that uh, is taken. So even if we get passage of safe banking, I don't know if it's going to really change, you know, the big financial centers, uh, their mind it, to, to get into this business. Well, it's interesting. I don't know. I was just reading the other day where they had all the heads of the big banks, Jamie Dimon and, and Moynihan and all these people. And they said, OK, raise your hand if you're for safe banking. And there was only one guy who raised his hand. Yeah. Um, I think I think it was the Bank of America guy, maybe the, the Wells guy, I forget. But uh, and Jamie Dimon, you know, did sort of this. He put his hands up in the air and they're like, well, what does that mean? <laughs> and he's like, well, you know, it sort of depends. And um, at the end of the day, I mean, it's an interesting article. Um, I just read it the other day and I was surprised at that. I was surprised that the banks, these big banks are like not like jumping for it. Like, why, why do you suppose that is? 
It's, it's just because of the risk, you know, there, you, you know, anytime you make a deposit of, of, of $10,000, you know, you have to make a, 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 a SARS report. You know, there's just a lot of compliance and things that need to be done uh, differently, maybe with cannabis than you would with other businesses. And, and so these bigger banks just, they've got enough banking business, you know, they don't really need it. Um, and, and, and in a way that might be good for cannabis companies too, because it allows the smaller credit unions and smaller SNL banks to, you know, work directly with cannabis companies and their banker, uh, and, and not some sort of corporate board that, that makes decisions, you know, in Charlotte or New York or wherever. Right. And I think at the end of the day, they, they sort of had some caveats of, yeah, we're not totally against it, but we want to see these things happen. And but yet the American Bankers Association of who they're all part of is behind this a thousand percent. So it was kind of weird to see their yeah. their reaction to it. And, and maybe it's just because, you know, the, the stigma, you know, um, is there for them. I it, it's really strange to see. But going back to 280E for a minute, um, some are hoping that past taxes that were paid under 280 will be refunded or at least or at least if the reschedule happens you know let's say in 2024 that they'll be able to use the benefit of that for taxes in that same year so yeah. is it possible uh, in your opinion that they could get that benefit that quickly of from 280 e relief yeah, I mean, if history is correct, I mean, in, in the past with any tax changes, you know, not cannabis related, but I'm just talking about normal changes in the tax law that that changes, you know, say the, the uh, tax rate or, you know, some other things that, that change in, in, in tax law, almost without exception, and I can't think of an exception, it's usually the following January 1 of the following year. So if something happened in 2024 to deschedule um, cannabis and 280E is no longer applicable, um, there certainly wouldn't be any refunds. There certainly would be no um, application of this retroactive. Uh, the best that I would see would be it would be effective January 1 of 2025. For tax years that begin on January. So that means your 2024 return would still be done under the old way. And, and you know, that's even true at the state level, too, because many states have decoupled from 280E. You know, so like a New York, a California, they don't follow 280E for state tax purposes. Um, yeah. And when they did that decoupling, they didn't do it like retroactive or anything like that. It's it's you know, perspective the following year. And some of the reason for all of this is, is that if you were to make it retroactive, then the budgets of the federal and state governments would have to be readjusted now because this revenue that was in the budget that they were expecting to get from cannabis would no longer be there. And that had to be made up by doing something else. Well, the money has already been allocated to all these other departments and all these other, you know, areas they wouldn't really want to go back and claw that revenue back into right. uh, the treasury. Well, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. So folks don't get your hopes up. Uh, even if it happens in 2024, that you're going to have that benefit uh, going backwards or in the current year, you're going to have to wait uh, for your filings in 2025. Uh, and I hate to be the Grinch here, you know, it's, it's, it's <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm just the messenger. I mean, it's just the way it is. And, you know, I'm, I'm all for it to, to change like everybody else here, but um, I, unfortunately I'm just being well, realistic. Well, come on, Mike. I mean, we all know that the government is, you know, they're, they're really good at not spending money. So, I mean, I'm sure that <laughs> they have a little reserve. They're going to, they're going to give that money back. <laughs> so you're not sure. the Grinch. You're just talking, you know, practicality. It's, it's yeah. really what's going to happen. So, you know, it, one of the things that, uh, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in the uh, mortgage industry creating a really cool technology in there. And, um, you know, one of the things that happened, unfortunately, in the 2008, you know, crisis, it was like Wall Street exited stage left, you know, after the big blow up. And, um, 
you know, we, we haven't quite seen a complete exit stage left of this industry, but we have seen a noticeable absence and um, and reduction of capital markets activity uh, in the industry. And we've also seen depressed values um, over the last 18 to 24 months. So if I'm looking at it as an investor, I'm saying there's some great opportunities out there. I mean, let's take like Kronos, for example. They're a, they're a big company. Uh, they have a cash buffer of 841 million as of Q2 of 2023. So when you when you look at that, but yet the company's valuation, enterprise valuation, is lower than that cash, you know, buffer. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's I, I think that a lot of these these companies are, you know, depressed in valuation. And when we look at all these hopeful things for the industry, including the destigmatization, the you know, the upcoming uh, legalization in other states and the positive movements that we can expect on the federal side. Uh, you know, I, I, I think cannabis is really, um, to me anyway, um, you know, poised for, you know, for those markets and values to come back. I mean, that's, I'm taking the positive approach on that. What's your thought about it? Well, I, I, I tend to agree, Brian, because, you know, cannabis, you know, had a real big uptick when, when Biden came into office and everybody was expecting him to legalize cannabis. And so valuations went up, stock prices for publicly traded cannabis companies went up and then we hit COVID and then that kind of threw a shock into the system and everything. But cannabis companies did pretty well during COVID because they were deemed essential businesses. They were able to operate when everybody else had their doors shut and, 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 People didn't have a lot of other choices. You know, if you're stuck at home, you can either, you know, watch Netflix, drink or take, you know, cannabis. right. <laughs> and, and so sales were pretty good. And then after we got out of, uh, of COVID, you know, the, the stock market, you know, started doing better um, and, and investors had choices to, to get into the market. But now I see that, you know, it looks like things are starting to maybe top out here, you know, this, you know, this month and then beginning in 2024 i think you know many people predict the overall market is going to be fairly flat and if that's the case you've got cannabis stocks that are down somewhere around 90 percent of their all-time highs and just as you said you know their book value may be far greater than the value that is you know attributed to their stock price and so you may have a great opportunity to kind of buy these cannabis stocks at the bottom, you know, because quite frankly, they can't really go much lower um, yeah. and, and things are, are starting to stabilize. Things were really rough the first two quarters this year, but starting in the third quarter and, and certainly here in the fourth quarter, things have uh, stabilized for cannabis companies. So let's let's hope we've sort of hit bottom uh, and we're, we're going to find our, our way up. And I think that's a positive sign for 2024 and beyond. But there's interesting things from like an accounting and uh, sort of controls perspective. You know, even though Kronos has all this cash, right, you know, the CEO of uh, uh, of Kronos said, while we execute on product innovation and this is a direct quote from him and revenue growth. We're simultaneously laser focused on reducing costs across our organization. So if they're slashing costs with all of that cash, um, I mean, it really shows what are they preparing for, you know, and what is what do they see in all of their expertise on the importance of cost reduction, profit maximization, they don't really have any debt because they got all this cash. But a lot of these companies that we see are carrying lots of debt. I mean, you know, significant debt load. So, you know, given that you see these big companies doing this and even Cureleaf, by the way, who's also sort of laser focused on on uh, reducing expenses. I mean, here's a company that reported muted revenue growth. I mean, basically four percent on a year over year basis. Um, in the beginning of the year, they're, they're, now their stock price is really seeing significant you know, increases, trending higher by 55% in just the last six months. So what can we, you know, what do you think we can learn from what these guys are saying and doing and what they're preparing for in the future and how that applies to how companies are running their businesses? 
Well, I think it's 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 a really a, a a test case there to for everybody else to to copy because you have to be efficient in this industry. You know the way the regulations are, the taxes, everything. You know it, it's a difficult business. You know much more difficult than people think it is because most people think that the margins are so extravagantly high. It doesn't matter what the taxes are. It doesn't matter how inefficient you are. And that's just not the case. You know, it, it, you really got to run this almost like with a thin margin, like a grocery store, you know, where it, you got to work on, you know, getting volume, but you know, the margin on per item is not going to be as high as, as you would expect it to be. And so having that extra cash certainly is going to give Kronos and others, you know, that ability to, you know, be op opportunistic. And if there's, let's say, a license in Florida that comes up uh, for sale, they'll be in a position to buy that license in cash um, and, and, and get into a market that everybody wants to get into. Florida is going to be one of the biggest markets that's, you know, you know, that's still left out there. You know, Florida, Pennsylvania are, are two of the biggest markets on the East Coast, certainly, that have not adopted full adult use yet. And when that happens, those are going to be the markets where, you know, companies like Acronos are going to be in a good position to to expand into those jurisdictions. Yeah. And I think that, you know, you don't have to be the size of Kronos or Curaleaf to get it right. Right. To 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 keep that clean balance sheet, to watch your expenses, because uh, some of these companies have huge, um, you know, grow expenses. Yeah. You know, that it makes it very difficult in an oversupply situation, depending on where you are, to really compete. So, you know, watching your expenses, making sure that you're looking at, you know, I always call it, you know, I don't know if it's an old term or not, activity-based accounting, right, or costing. So you're looking at everything you're doing and uh, really applying automation, applying business process, um, good business process and oversight to these um you know, to the administrative side and the growth side and the production side uh, to be able to reduce your expenses, increase that that profitability and preserve cash. And I think some companies are waiting for this boon of 280E, which, uh, as we talked about earlier, you know, don't count on it anytime soon. You have to assume that it's not going to happen. And when it does happen, it's a positive upside to your cash position of your business. Now, <clears throat> and that's important, Brian, because you can't rely on this descheduling of 280E to make yourself profitable. You need to be profitable before this descheduling takes place, because if you're profitable before it takes place, then management is doing all the right things. You know, but, you know, too many companies are, are, are really hurting with their working capital and they're not running their, their companies very efficiently. And I, I want to say about. 2000 licenses in California were not renewed this year because they, wow. they just didn't have the, the capital to, to keep going. And, you know, you can't go out buying Ferraris and buy homes and take luxurious trips to Cabo, whatever, uh, and, and still think you're going to make a go of this. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So uh, that's, that's interesting. That's a lot of companies that the license is not getting renewed. So I want to certainly say that's about 50%. Warranty. I think there's about 4,000 licenses in California and about 50% wow. of them did not renew or they just, you know, let their license lapse. Well, it's good for the, uh, for the good operators and it's good for the, uh, you know, I guess for the control situation, because demand is just continues to go up. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, but it, it brings up an interesting uh, point about business valuation as well. And uh, when I saw this Kronos thing, it's like, wait a minute. I mean, I've been in the software business for many years. So we look at exponential, um, you know, five to 10 X of revenue in good software companies for evaluation. It's a pretty easy, you know, calculation and some services businesses are looking more on multiples of EBITDA, but you know, this industry is sort of valued almost on a fair value uh, model, which is really hard to understand and predict in this industry. When you look at Kronos, they've got their, their enterprise value is lower than the cash they have on their balance sheet. And normally that cash gets added to your valuation. I mean, what is going on here with business valuation and where do you see that going? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's still obviously the stigma. You, you, it's still federally illegal. You still have the issue of, of you know, safe banking and 280E to deal with. You know, with all these things, you know, that are they're just anchors that are pulling the the market and their valuation down. You know, more than it should be. And and you know, there are now some large MSOs that are diversifying and starting to buy you know breweries and doing things that are outside of cannabis but maybe related to cannabis by buying a brewery you can get into the beverage business and um you know maybe come up with some sort of thc cbd drinks you know whatever um but that type of diversification is is one means that some of these companies are, are used to you know make themselves not be a pure cannabis company but maybe cannabis plus something else yeah it's interesting and um you know, sort of going back and tying in the importance of clean accounting and careful controls. Um, I, I recently read an analyst report that um, that had many predictions for 2024. And by the way, they were all bullish from an investor perspective. So very positive signs. But one of them was uh, they stated that marijuana companies will bear the fruits of their financial housekeeping. So during the recent slump, the better managed operators focused on eliminating unnecessary expenses and shoring up balance sheets. They rationalize their businesses to focus on those elements that enhance profitability and positive free cash flow. So by early next year, we'll see many upside surprises <clears throat> in quarterly operational results due to margin improvement. And that's interesting because it goes right back to everything we're talking about. Good financial controls, good financial housekeeping, and truly you know, having the right people in the organization that can help you maximize, you know, profits. It seems like it's 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 a must in order to take advantage of this, you know, quote unquote, bull market in the industry that many are predicting. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree. That's it, it's it's so it's so critical. And, you know, because when you look at all the different things that are, are being, you know, predicted that in, in the positive side, it really is, I think, a good five to 10 year outlook for this business, despite the fact that we may have an overall down market uh, in the future. So I uh, want to uh, shift a little bit and talk about um, technology and blockchain. And, um, you know, you and I talked about this uh, before, and we both agreed that when you talk about blockchain, you have to almost talk about what it's not first, as opposed to, you know, what it is. So um, blockchain and Bitcoin in cryptocurrencies are not synonymous. So we have to, first of all, get that out that uh, everybody who says, you know, what I tell her, I have, we have a blockchain based system. They're like, oh, cryptocurrency. No, not cryptocurrency. So Cryptocurrency uses a form of blockchain for the governance. That blockchain is is called Ethereum that they actually use. So it's a multi-distributed um, blockchain network versus a, a managed blockchain that we use, which is more a B2B blockchain. But let's talk about what it is. So very simply, it's, it's, it's like a digital ledger or record keeping system, but it's way more secure and more transparent than traditional methods. So what are those traditional methods? Well, a traditional method would be a, um, would be a database. So instead of a, a single authority or database, it's more of a decentralized network of computers that work together to store and verify information and validate and verify information. So when somebody makes a transaction or adds information to the blockchain, and the dog loves blockchain too, which is cool. And that's okay. Cause my dog is sitting right next to me, but he doesn't, he, he's sort of just happy uh, listening to me. <laughs> he, he falls asleep at my voice. Hopefully. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's all right. So um, when somebody makes a transaction or adds information to the blockchain, it's stored. I mean, picture it like a block or, or a box or a hash and each block contains a bunch of transactional information. And once that block is full, it then gets linked to a previous block, creating a chain of blocks 
of these transactions. And that's why they call it sort of blockchain because it's all daisy chained together. So if data is changed or updated, it does not overwrite that previous information. It creates another block that's associated with it. So chained to it that shows the updated information. So every time a piece of information is changed or update, instead of updating the value and losing sight of what it used to be, which by the way, when we're talking about accounting and we're talking about supply chain and we're talking about all these things, how important it is to make sure that these things are, are not only do you have the current data, but what happened to the old data, right? Very, very critical. Cause when the auditors come in, right? When there's a lawsuit, when something bad is happening, the, the whole thing becomes discoverable and they're looking for, okay, what happened? Who did what? And blockchain gives that excellent auditing and tracking of critical information. So uh, Joy, can you bring up a, um, uh, the diagram of uh, credi credible and we'll, uh, of our model and we'll talk about how the, the blockchain works there. And, so and while you're doing that, Joy, you know, I have to say that, you know, this is really going to change the way we do audits, too, because having a blockchain, then all you have to do is verify, you know, the information going in and how it's you know, deposited there. And once that's been verified, then all of the things that we normally would have to go to do all these tests and everything like that won't be necessary because once you verify that, that the system is working correctly, then that's it. And, and it really will make our job so much easier. And it just creates a, just another layer of real, you know, credibility to the data. So you hear that folks, less billable hours from the accountants. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's absolutely true. <laughs> All right. So, you know, the, the technology um, is utilized in the, the credible environment to basically validate and verify everything going on in the industry. So um, this technology is is really very important to to the credible uh, model, because what happens is we are an ecosystem or digital registry of quality companies like Armanino and that includes brands. So it includes CBD and hemp companies and, uh, and cannabis companies as well. And there's a lot of people who really have to follow everything about these companies, right? Um, you know, so if you're, a, if you're a cannabis operator, they need to make sure from a KYC perspective, we were talking about earlier from banking that you're licensed, right? Um, they need to make sure like even in credit card transactions in CBD and hemp, they got to make sure that they're doing their KYC monitoring and that you're, you're not only have the appropriate certifications or licensing if required, but those lab reports are tying to the product. So we've actually created an entire ecosystem that brings all of the data together. So it helps, uh, companies to manage their vendors and licensing tracking and SOP and policy management, integrating to track and trace systems so we can follow all that data. And the same thing on the enterprise commerce side that we link together as well. And then these vendors and all the different players that are out in the industry are getting validated and verified. So when we have a, a lab report, for example, it comes directly from the lab and it gets written into the blockchain. So what do people talk about? Well, did somebody modify your monkey with the with the lab report? Nope, can't happen because it went into the blockchain. It's immutable. So and it's a third party independent blockchain where it becomes vaulted and verified uh, relative to the players on either side. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about how that gets done. And by the way, these companies, this is very critical information to these companies uh, that are using it. But down on the bottom of the model, you know, when you look at financial institutions and consumers and social media networks, you know, they also have to see that you're a true company. You're doing the right things. You have your licenses, your certifications, your lab reports in order and all of that information. And then it also plays into accounting, as as uh, Mike said earlier. So when you look at blockchain, it is being used in the cannabis industry. It is the basis of everything we do at, at Credible in automating. We also use artificial intelligence around that because it can help streamline and simplify the regulatory compliance process by, by providing this single source of truth to all stakeholders. And that's really, really important. So it's not only about 
the tracking and verification, but it's also about how we lock it down, keep it safe. Uh, Mike, any other thoughts on blockchain uh, before we move on from that technology? No, I think it's just going to be, you know, really change the industry, you know, like it has many other industries, you know, um, you know, blockchain has been used for many different purposes. You know, we always hear about cryptocurrencies, but, you know, even, you know, like IBM, I think, came out with one of the first blockchains tracing uh, fish, you know, so that from when it was, you know, um, caught to when it hit your, you know, table at a restaurant, you know, they were able to verify that, hey, that was Chilean sea bass and not some other fish that was called Chilean sea bass. Yep, absolutely right. And a lot of other industries do this and uh, more to come on that with Credible and uh, some standards uh, groups that we're, uh, we're working with. We'll be having some guests on our broadcasts uh, coming up about that and how important that this is done in other industries. It's done in the food industry, right? But it's really not done really well in this industry. We're just tracking strain and THC. But we need to know more about these products, especially the stuff that we're putting in our mouth. We're consuming as food. You know, we're consuming as beverages. So we're going to see changes. And when this whole rescheduling happens, well, it's going to eventually put, you know, some additional uh, guidance from the government. But folks, let's not wait. Let's not wait for the government to tell us what to do. <laughs> Right. We don't want that. We want to show them that we we know how to handle this industry. We understand safety and security. And blockchain is is critical to the production side of the business, the growing and production side, as well as the administrative accounting and, and all of that tracking. So anyway, that's my big commercial on blockchain. Very, very uh, important. Uh, Joy, you can take that uh, diagram down. Um, you know, Mike, I'm sure it's it probably drives you crazy as it does with me. But, you know, look, we're 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 leading different companies in the industry here. And uh, we get a lot, asked a lot about what's your predictions? What is 2024 going to look like? Any, uh, you know, w would you care to break out your Armanino crystal ball and uh, tell us what you think? You know, it's it's very tricky to do that in this industry because, you know, everybody thought, five years ago that, hey, we would have safe banking and three years ago we would have descheduling of cannabis and all these different things that everybody has predicted over the years. And I've just come to learn that it's always going to take longer than you expect it to take. Um, so you're I, not an economist because if you were an economist, you'd be making all sorts of predictions and they yeah, never get I, held to them. <laughs> Well, and that's the thing. I, I think there, there, we are going into 2024 with a more optimistic spirit than what we had in, in 23. Uh, 23, you know, first quarter, like some of the conferences and things that I attend, it was doom and gloom. You know, it was high interest rates. You know, it was just people were having challenges being able to run their businesses. But I think a lot of things have been kind of flushed out this year. And, and now the companies have become smarter about you know their cash management working on on being more efficient reducing their their costs and, and focusing on their core businesses so, you know some of these businesses kind of went into different tangents and now they're pulling things back and and going back to their roots of what they really know how to do best and so i i see companies doing much better in 24 than in in 23. So I'm going to make a couple of predictions, which is really bold for me because I um, and, and and I'll see what you think about it. But um, so here we are. It's 2023, and the farm bill from 2018 on the CBD and hemp side has like it's nowhere to be seen. So I'm going to predict, and I think this is a safe one, that CBD rules from the FDA are unlikely in 2024. <laughs> so. That's I'm just just saying, I don't know, because we haven't seen the farm bill. So, so well, yeah, know. they've extended it, I think, through it was supposed to expire this month, but I think they extended it to January, which then that becomes a whole nother issue about, you know, how and if that's going to get extended. And, and, you know, there's certainly issues there with, you know, Delta eight, Delta nine and, and some of these synthetic THC products. So, um I, there is. And I think, you know, look, this is another area where I'm saying, folks, let's get our stuff together before, you know, that happens. Right. I'm, I'm a huge believer in that. And I know there's, you know, we're in, involved in some great work groups and more on that soon. 
uh, about that. But I just don't see it happening, which is not a bad thing from the perspective is that it gives us time to get our stuff together. I'm also going to predict that um, I've been seeing like you saw Cureleaf heading over to uh, Germany. Like they're actually coming out of like states like Vermont and they're heading to Germany. Right. So I think Germany, I mean, which is what the largest economy in the EU on that side, right over yep. across the pond. You know, I think that's going to be a significant catalyst for growth, even into like uh, Canada and, um, you know, in other areas. I think it's going to set um, the, the I mean, it's it, it looks good. I mean, the prospects for that in the wellness market in Germany, I think, will really uh, play well and be seen as a growth catalyst. What are your thoughts about yeah. that? And, and I think that's going to create an interesting issue because then we may have the same situation that we have here in the U.S. where certain states have legalized cannabis and others have not. And then we could have the same situation in the EU where Germany uh, goes the way of like Uruguay and, and just disregards treaties and things that we have between various countries about cannabis and, and legalizes it. And then you could have a situation where Germany is legal, but the EU is not. And, and so create the same difficulties that we've had before. Well, here's here's um, here's my last prediction. All right. I'm going to make my last prediction and it involves Armanino. OK, <laughs> so I think Armanino's business is going to grow next year in this space in particular. <laughs> Why? Because when you go to these conferences, we're seeing more and more suits in the room. Right? So as the as the investors start to come back, they're going to demand a higher level of professionalism. They're going to demand more of those ancillary services that they feel comfortable with by giving you capital, by setting you up for acquisition, by, you know, whatever it is, those things we're talking about. So uh, even though consolidation, you know, is probably going to happen. We, we need a stronger business approach and disciplines. We need to continue that in this industry. Let the growers be growers and, and uh, the manufacturers who are excellent at what they do. I've met some amazing growers in this space and God bless them. They're really good at what they do, but they've got to work with the experts uh, that understand things like finance and accounting and tax uh, and even technology, because Armanino has a uh, has a technology consulting side of the business where they can help you tie these processes together uh, with with technology. So that's my prediction. Um, I think you're going to you're going to get bigger in this industry. And uh, I think <laughs> we're and we're thrilled to be partnered with you uh, in that regard. Any last minute thoughts that uh, that you have uh, before we uh, we end the webinar? Yeah, I'll just touch on the fact that it's really great working with you and your team and, and that I think this is the kind of thing that, you know, this industry sorely needs is what you were talking about professionalism. You know, there's a lot of executives that are coming in from the food and beverage industry into this industry. And that's a, a far cry from what was prevalent, say, three, four years ago, where you just had people that were transitioning from the illegal market to the legal market. Now you've got mainly, you know, like what I call East Coast companies that are being formed that are bringing in professional man management on day one and realize that, look, if, if we're going to be making a 10 million, 20 million dollar investment in this startup cannabis company or whatever, then, hey, we're going to make sure that it has professional management on day one. And, you know, if, if you are an existing cannabis company, that's where you want to be because you don't want you know, some newcomer that's got professional management, got all their books and records, got blockchain, got all these technology things working for them, you know, because it'll be difficult for you to compete against that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, uh, Mike, how can folks get in touch with uh, with you if uh, they're interested in being one of those winners in the future? Well, uh, Armanino.com uh, is our website. And within there, there's, you know, we've got all these different industry groups. Cannabis is one of them. And, and you can see our thought leadership there as well as services that we provide. And then in the body of that work, it will have a, a mention of, of me and, and, and my contact information. 
Well, your thought leadership and those of your partners um, have been really tremendous for this industry. And kudos to your organization for really planting a flag in this space and being committed to it and uh, bringing the level of professionalism and expertise. Uh, we're really honored to be working with you at uh, Credible and uh, together we're looking forward to uh, great things in the future. So uh, thanks, Mike, for joining us and all the great people at uh, Arm, Arm and Eno. And Joy, as always, thanks for keeping us on track and yeah. making us look good. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you. Take care. All right.